morning, everyone. I'm glad, glad you're here this morning, and uh, we are uh, in a series called Breakthrough, and next week we're going to wrap it up, and this week I'm really excited because this passage uh, that we're going to dig into I think is really, really important in our life because there are two verses in this passage that I feel like often kind of get uh, taken out of context and get used in different ways that I don't really think God um, wants us to, to use them in that way. So hopefully uh, you'll see that and you'll be able to kind of take from this and, and glean from it and understand better what God is saying uh, through this passage. But as we begin, I want you to think about uh, this question with me and, and, and kind of process this idea. What in your life, what, what would your life look like? If you knew for sure that God would meet every need in your life, that you, whatever's going on in your life, whatever may be happening in your life, whatever needs you have, if it's, if it's physical, if it's emotional, if it's spiritual, uh, maybe financial, maybe health related, whatever it is, if you knew that God would meet that need and God would take care of your need, what would your life look like? Would anything be different? Would you maybe have a peace that you don't have right now? Would, would you be able to rest in this peace that, that God is in control? And, you know, that song that we just sang, I, I just love that. That's one of my favorite hymns of all time, Great Is Thy Faithfulness. It's, it's vertical and it's singing to God, and, and I just love that. You know, every need that I have, your hand is supplying your, your faithfulness, God, can be trusted. And so whatever's going on in my life, whatever need I may have, if I really believed, if I knew that God would meet that need, what might be different? How would you approach life? How would you approach that situation? How would you approach any circumstance that's going on in your life? And because these things, as they dig into us, the circumstances of our life tend to, to cause us to forget the promises and the, the blessings and what God wants to bring in our life. And you think about God meeting the needs of our life. God has given us a promise in his word that he will meet our needs. In the book of Philippians, this is one of those verses that we need to dig into the context. But look at Philippians chapter 4 verse 19. It says this. And my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. That is a promise of God. That God will meet your needs, physical, emotional, spiritual, whatever's going on in your life. The word of God tells us in Philippians 4.19 that God is making a promise that he will meet all of our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. But just taking that without looking at all the verses around that is very dangerous. And it may not be what God wants us to understand if we just lift this out of its context and hold it up to any situation and any circumstance in, in our life. Can we just believe that God is going to meet those needs? Whatever's going on, whatever's happening. We're going to talk about that this morning and, and hopefully gain a better understanding. It's interesting in the context of Philippians chapter 4, there's another verse, I think, that's often lifted out of context and kind of used to mean and used to say things that God may not intend for it to say. It's found in verse 13, Philippians 4, 13. Some of you may know this verse. I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. You may have read a translation that, that reads like this. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. And when we lift that out of the context and don't understand what Paul is talking about, then you could say, okay, well, I'm going to tell my kids they can be anything that they want to be when they grow up. Maybe not. You got to be careful to use that verse and just say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I guarantee you I will never make the U.S. Olympic team in the 100-yard dash. It ain't going to happen. I mean, this, this ain't going fast, you know what I mean? 
I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. I'm going to make the Olympic team. Yeah, you're laughing. It's, it ain't going to happen. I guarantee you I'm not going to be a rocket scientist. You're <laughs> laughing there. He's on our finance team because he knows I can't do math. And so I'm terrible with numbers. I mean, I'll never be any good with math. I'll never be any good with numbers. So, I mean, this is not going to happen. And we can take these verses and lift them out of their context and not understanding what Paul is talking about here and say, well, I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength and God will meet all of our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Does that really mean what it means? What I want to do today is dig into this idea that God will provide. And I'm not just talking about finances here. This isn't, really, this, this isn't really a message on finances and on giving as much as it is this idea that God has given us this promise in the word of God that he will meet all of our needs according to his riches and glory. And that's just not financial. That's, that's spiritual. That's emotional. That's physical. That, that's the thing that God wants us to bless us with. Whatever need we have, God is the great provider and he will meet those needs. But we need to understand this in the context in which it was given to us in Philippians chapter 4. So in order for us to do that, I want you to find in your Bibles Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to begin to look in chapter 4 at verse 10. And let me even kind of expand the context for us. As we understand, this book was written by this man named Paul. We are, I'm talking about him in a minute as Saul. He was Saul of Tarsus. He came to faith in Jesus Christ. He became the greatest missionary, evangelist, theologian. You know, he wrote so much of the New Testament that we have, probably at least half, maybe more. It can be debated. But this guy, Paul, is writing this letter to the church at Philippi. And at the, this church in Philippi, the whole theme of the letter is joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. You know, joy and rejoicing is such a big part of what Paul is teaching to this church at Philippi. And it's interesting in the context when he comes into chapter 4, beginning in verse 10, the very first thing that he says here in verse 10 is, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Here's this idea of rejoicing and joy again. Well, what is he rejoicing in the Lord in? What is bringing him this joy? It's the fact that these people, these believers at Philippi, were being very generous and they were supplying the needs that he had for ministry and the needs that he had in his personal life. That they were taking care of Paul, that they were sending missionary funds like we support missionaries and we support ministries and we support many other things that don't happen in these four walls. And so this money and these gifts that were coming from this church at Philippi, he is saying, you guys were amazing and you're such a blessing. And I am rejoicing greatly because once again, this isn't the first time that they have supported him, but notice what he says, but once again, you renewed your care for me. You were in fact concerned about me. He says, but in times past, you couldn't show it, but this time you could. He goes on to say in verse 11, I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I find myself. I know both how to make, with, uh, make do with little, and I know how to make do with a lot. He says, in any and all circumstance, I have learned the secret. Now, this is, this is really important. The secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or need. Now, notice verse 13 comes in this context. What context? The secret of being content. The issue of the circumstances of his life, whether he's had a bunch or whether he's had nothing, he says, I can do all things through him who gives me the strength. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. I can live in abundance or I can live with great need. The circumstance isn't the issue here. I've learned to be content. 
in all circumstances, in any circumstance. I can do all things through him who gives me the strength. And he goes on and he says this, Still, you did well by partnering with me in my hardship. And you Philippians know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, he's talking about he's starting his missionary journeys, that no church is shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent gifts for my needs several times. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that is increasing to your account. Let me just stop there for a minute. It's really important for us to understand that Paul was teaching the church at Philippi that God notices when we serve. God notices when we give. God notices when we sacrifice. God notices when we use our gifts, when we're a blessing to others. And there is like this account that, that God is, is storing up there. Jesus spoke about it as well. He said, don't store up treasures for yourself here on earth where moth and rust and can, can destroy, where thieves break in and steal. He said, store up for yourselves treasure in heaven. There's an account that God is keeping, not in relation to salvation. Please do not get this mixed up. This isn't about our salvation. This is about our works and our generosity and our blessing and the way we serve one another and the way we pour out our love toward one another. And Paul says, there is, when you send this gift, it, yes, it's blessing him. Yes, it's providing for missionary needs. Yes, it's helping the gospel go forth. But the truth also is that this gift is actually being credited to their account. That God notices everything we do. Proverbs 15, 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch over the evil and the good. Hebrews 6, 10. God has not forgotten the works that you have done. God takes into account everything that you're doing, and it's going into your account. What a blessing today. Now, he goes on to say this. He says, but I have received everything in full, and I have an abundance. And here I am fully supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you provided. It's a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And then here's our verse. And my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And then he finishes it with this praise to God. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. So how do we know that God is going to provide? How can we be sure that Philippians 4.19 can be claimed by us and that we can hold on to the truth that God is going to supply every need that we have? Well, see, first of all, I want you to understand, it doesn't start with the outward stuff. God doesn't necessarily want to concern us to be only concerned with the outward and being sure that our physical needs are, are met. He's going to say, I'm going to take you and show you that God's work begins on the inside. If we go back to verses 10 through 13, here's what we're going to see. Is that our obedience, through obedience, God provides... Go to, the, uh, go to the, not the verses for me, but where I'm talking about God providing through our obedience that he gives an inner strength. Through this, this work that God is doing in us, this strength is, is providing for us uh, as we walk in obedience this kind of contentment and this peace and this desire that God is at work and we experience breakthrough when we're walking in the will of God. When we are walking in the will of God, when we know that we are carrying out God's will. The Apostle Paul knew it didn't matter if he had a bunch or if he had nothing. When he's in the will of God, when he's, he's obedient, and that's when breakthrough comes, when we're walking in a way that we is at work regardless of the circumstance or the situation, whether it's plenty or whether it's little. That's why he says, 
I learned the secret of being content. Imagine that. There's a secret of being content. Now, for most of us, and, and I've, I've fallen into this trap and still fall into it many, many times. And I think, wait a minute. I don't like this circumstance. I don't like this situation. I don't like what's going on. I, I'm not happy. And I lose my contentment when my focus is on the circumstances and on the situations of my life. I become discontent. Now, I'm not saying there's not a time to have holy discontent. I'm not saying there's not a time that we ought to desire change. But I'm talking about just with the circumstances and the situations of our life that sometimes aren't pleasant, we don't have contentment when God wants us to get it. How many of you know that for many people, circumstances keep them from being content? And here's what Paul says. Circumstances should not keep us from experiencing contentment. That's exactly what he says. You shared a gift with me, but even if you hadn't shared that gift, I still know the secret of being content. Because I've learned how to live when there's been very little, and I've learned, learned how to live when there's been great abundance. And see, what Paul is saying is, I know I'm right in the middle of God's will. When you're in the middle of God's will, that is what brings contentment. And see, in verse 12, he says this. He says, I know both how to make do with little, and I know how to make do with lot, a lot. And then notice these words. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the, situ uh, the secret of being content. Any circumstance. All circumstance. He has learned this, that you and I can be content in any and all circumstances. And usually, here's what we say, right? God, if you'll change this, then I'll be happy. If you'll make this, you know, different, then, then I'll be okay. And instead, God's saying, there is a secret of contentment through any and all circumstances. Does that mean that it's pleasant? No, not necessarily. Does that mean that it's something that, that you, you just want to continue to live in? No, not necessarily. You can ask God to change it. You can ask God uh, to make it different. But how in the world do we learn how to be content in any and all circumstances? You have to understand what the will of God is for your life. Are you walking in the will of God? If you're walking in the will of God, if you're doing the will of God, and the circumstances are not pleasant, then you know that God is allowing those circumstances to come into your life for some reason, either to make us better or to shine uh, the glory of God through adversity, to show people that God is our strength, that God is the one who is helping us you know, walk through these, these difficult times. I'm convinced that sometimes God allows believers to go through the deep weeds, not simply because as an act of judgment or an act of punishment, but simply to show the world that God is enough, that God is good and he is enough. And I can, I can, I can learn to be content in this situation. So why is the will of God so important? Because when we're in the will of God, we know that we're at peace with God. We're not fighting God. And see, Here's three things. We need obedience, first of all, in our alignment. If you're in the will of God, that means you're going to be in alignment with God. You're going to be walking in obedience. And the verses won't come up, but a but we, few weeks ago, I talked about Romans 12, 1 and 2. And if you're a note taker, write down Romans 12, 1 and 2 to remind you that this is so important that we talked about in order to be in the will of God that we have to present our bodies as a living and holy sacrifice which is pleasing unto God. That means that we offer the totality of ourself to God and say, God, I want to be in your will, and so I don't want to be doing anything that is against your will. I don't want to be walking outside of your will. I don't want to be going in a direction that you don't want me to go. When you're aligned with God, and, and first of all, alignment comes when we come into faith with Jesus Christ, right? Faith in Jesus, 
coming into a, a perfect uh, relationship with God. We're not at enmity with God anymore. God becomes our heavenly father. But some of us know, even as Christians, we can stray and we can get out of alignment and we can, we can start walking in a path that God doesn't want us to walk in. And here's the deal. Usually when we're walking in a path that is out of the will of God, we kind of do it with attitude. Yeah, I see you're shaking your head, right? Yeah, we do, don't we? It's like, man, I'm... I'm going to do this. And, you know, God, and it's kind of like we begin to fight against God, fight against the things of God, and fight against the plans and the purposes of God. And let me just tell you, when we fight with God, here's the bottom line. You never win. We're not going to win. There is no way for us to win the fight when we fight against God. He is sovereign. He is bigger. He is holy. He is powerful. His will prevails. His will will always prevail. We cannot fight against God. Remember I told you that the guy who wrote this book of Philippians is named Paul. We know him as Paul, but before he was Paul, he was Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. He studied at the feet of Gamaliel. He knew the law. He knew the word of God. He was zealous. He was righteous. And he wanted the things that God wanted, he thought. And so when this Christianity came on the scene, it's called the way, when this new kind of belief rose up and Jesus of Nazareth started gaining momentum and Christianity was taking off, what did Saul of Tarsus do? He fought against it. He did everything he could to stamp out this new belief of Christianity. He was not in alignment with God, so what did God do? Saul was on this road to Damascus getting ready to persecute more believers and more Christians and try to tear down the work of God. So what did God do? God showed up on the road to Damascus, blinding light. Saul falls to the ground. He's blind, and he cries out, Who art thou, Lord? Are you the Lord? I mean, if you're the Lord, I, I don't want to be out of alignment. I don't want to fight against you. And what did God say? What did Jesus, who was revealed to him on the road to Damascus, remember what he said in the King James? There's interesting words. He said, he said, Saul, it's hard to kick against the pricks. Now, that just sounds weird, right? I mean, kick against the pricks. What's he saying? In some translations, you know, use goat. It's, it's the idea, Saul, quit trying to fight me. You're never going to win when you fight against God. Get in alignment. Do the will of God. There has to be obedience in our alignment. Now, here's the second thing. There has to be obedience in our attitude. Remember Romans 12, 1 and 2? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. And how do we do that? By the renewing of our mind. Is your attitude in obedience? Are you obedient in your attitude toward the Lord? You aligned with the will of God? Are you walking in obedience with the right mindset so that we're transformed by the renewing of our mind? And then we will be able to prove that which is the will of God, the good, the pleasing, and the acceptable will of God. That means that there will be obedience in our actions, that when we live out our life, we'll be going in the right direction. We're aligned, we have the right attitude, and our actions are correct. And listen, when all that happens, when that's going on in our life, that doesn't mean that you will be in great circumstances. That doesn't mean that you won't have any difficulties. That doesn't mean that you may not have hardship, but here's what it does mean. It does mean Philippians 4.13 can be true in your life and my life, and here's what we can say. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. I have learned the secret of contentment, being in the will of God, Walking in alignment, walking in obedience in my actions and my attitude. And I know that whether I have plenty or I have want, God, you're still taking care of me. 
That's that inner strength that God provides through obedience. But here's the second thing. Through obedience, we learn that God provides the outward supply. Listen, he begins on the inside. It's the inner strength. I can do all things through him who gives me the strength. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It begins on the inside, but then it begins to flow on the outside. And as, as we walk in the will of God, God begins to do things that, that we didn't expect him to do. God begins to show up in ways that we didn't expect him to show up in. He always comes through. And in Philippians 4.19, that's where in this context of, of them supplying the needs for this mission work and them supplying the blessing that Paul needed in his life, he, he just issues this, this promise. He says to them, and my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Here's what Paul is saying. Paul's not saying you can just hold this verse out and say God's going God's to meet every need of your life. And there's no condition with that. This is a conditional promise. There are promises in the word of God that I believe are not conditional. For instance, Jesus gave us the promise that says, Whoever will come unto me, I'll not cast out. I, I won't turn you away if you come to me. The Bible says whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. There's no conditions with that. If you call upon the name of the Lord, if, if, if God draws you to himself and you call upon the name of the Lord, you can be a thief hanging on the cross, condemned you know, to die, and guess what? Jesus will look at you and say, today you'll be with me in paradise. You call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. It doesn't matter what circumstance or situation you bring. But this, Paul is saying, here's how I know God is going to take care of you. Because you've walked in obedience. You're doing the will of God. You're supplying. You are generous. You are giving. And, and he, like he said, it's not that I'm, I'm asking you to give to me. He says, really what you're giving is just being credited to your account. It's going to your account. See, here's a truth that we need to remember. Obedience always activates the conditional promises of God in our life. Mom and dad, let me ask you a question. If you've had kids, and if you haven't had kids, we've all been kids. So we can all relate to this. Think about your parents or think about you as a parent. Did you reward disobedience in your children's life? Some of you are going, yeah, I did, and I'm paying the price for it. <laughs> See, we understand as parents, right, we, we don't want to reward disobedience. What do we want to do? We want to reward obedience. And see, God is the same way. When, when we walk in obedience, there's this reward that comes, that God meets our needs. It doesn't say, this isn't a prosperity thing. This isn't saying that God's going to make you rich, that God's going to give you a bigger house, bigger bank account, big, nicer car, you know, all that. No, God says, I'm going to meet your needs. I'm going to take care of you. Emotionally, physically, spiritually, I'm going to supply whatever you need when you walk in obedience, when you do the will of God. You can understand that this promise can be yours, that you can claim it. And you see, we don't see this only here in Scripture. In the Old Testament, this is a psalm of David. And uh, look in Psalm 37, uh, verse 21. And I'm going to, I want you to see this. This is a psalm of David. David says this, The wicked person borrows and does not repay, but the righteous one is gracious and giving. Now the reason I wanted you to see this is I want to set up another verse that comes about three verses later in the psalm. But here, notice how David is defining the righteous here. 
This isn't a totality. This isn't a complete definition of righteousness. But he's saying that the righteous person is going to act in a way that is pleasing to God. The righteous person is going to be moral. They're going to pay their debts. They're going to be gracious. They're going to be giving. Now, this kind of person represents God and is righteous in the sense in the way he's conducting himself. But in verse 25, look what David says. I have been young and now I am old, yet I have not seen who? The righteous abandoned or forsaken, some translations say, or his children begging for bread. You know what God's telling us here? God's saying, if you honor me, I'll honor you. If you love on people, you'll be loved. If, if you take care of people, you'll be taken care of. It's, it's this idea that God is going to honor this righteousness that we have in our life. And here's a principle of God. God always blesses and rewards generosity. And I'm not talking about money alone here. Please don't leave here and think, oh, it's a money sermon. If that's what you're hearing, you're, you're missing out on, on something that's important. We can be generous in a lot of different ways than just money. You can be generous with your time. You can be generous with your love. You can be generous with your affection. You can be generous in the way that you minister and use your gifts. You can be generous in so, so many ways. And God always blesses and rewards generosity. Jesus spoke a principle in Luke chapter 6. And the context, matter of fact, he says, if you want to be forgiven, then forgive. Don't, don't ask to be forgiven if you're not a forgiving person. And then isn't it interesting, he says here in Luke 6, 38, give and it shall be given to you. Press down, shaken together, running over, shall it be provided for you. Give and it shall be given to you. The writer of Proverbs also gives us a principle in Proverbs eleven twenty five. 25. It says, he who waters will himself be watered. You know what that means? If you're a generous person, that generosity is going to come back to you. I heard people say sometimes, you know, I was sick and nobody checked on me. Well, I wonder how many people do you check on when you're sick? I was in the hospital. Nobody came to the hospital. When's the last time you went and visited a hospital? You see, the truth is, if we expect something, then we need to be willing to give it. He who waters will himself be watered. The generous person will find generosity coming back to them. And that's the principle that God is given in his word. He always blesses and rewards generosity. So I have a question for you this morning. As a next step, here's what I want you to think about. What will you do, do differently this week knowing that God will meet every need of your life? Will you learn the secret of contentment? Will you get your eyes off of your circumstances and the situations and will you put them on, the, on God and say, am I aligned in, my, in, my, uh, am I in your will? Am I walking in your will? Am I doing what you have called me to do? Is there obedience flowing out of my life? God, is, is, that, is that what you want me to do? Is there somebody you need to minister to knowing that when you give that ministry, God is going to bless you and reward you? Not because of that. It's just going to be a byproduct of it. My God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And regardless of the circumstance that you find yourself in, here's what you and I know. That we can do all things through Christ who gives us the strength. We can get through this. Because God is going to give us the strength to do it. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, I pray by your love and by your grace that you would help us understand how powerful you are. You are a great God. Great is your faithfulness, God. 
You prove it morning by morning. You show us your mercy and you renew your love to us. and You strengthen us. And God, whatever circumstance and situation we find ourselves in, we know that we can trust you in that. I ask, Lord, that if there's a person here today who's not in relationship with you, God, right now, Father, will you please draw them to yourself? Open their eyes, open their heart to see your goodness and how you provided a way for us to be in a relationship with you. We love you, Father. We thank you that you're such a good God. Your promises are true. Help us to walk in them. Help us to walk obediently and see the blessing of God being poured in our life and through our lives as we bless others. And we want to be the kind of people who are generous with our time, with our abilities, with our resources. So God, use us in this time. Help us this week to live differently knowing that you're going to meet every need of our life. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand our feet. Our worship team is going to lead us in a response. Can you trust God in all things? Can you say that he's going to give you the strength? Can you say that he's going to supply every need you have? We're going to sing a song about trusting it all. Trust you all, God. Can you really say that? I hope you can. If you're here today and you don't know Christ, we would love to talk to you about that. We're going to have our prayer team here at the front. Whatever need you have, if you need prayer, if you want to pray for someone else, then come during this response time.
awesome day that we've had at Five Stone. We hope that you have had an awesome day as well. If you're wondering what your next step might be, please come talk to us in the Connect Center. See y'all next week.